Hi, this is Ethan Hein. Welcome to Play With Your Music. In this series of videos, we're going to be talking about the basics of music theory, how chords and scales work, and how you can use them to do your own compositions and arranging. Uh, in this first video, we're just going to be talking about some terminology, some names of things, and some general music concepts. In the next video, we're going to be talking about how even a totally naive and untrained pianist can actually get quite a few useful chords and scales out of the piano. Um, and the couple of videos after that are just going to elaborate on even more fabulous, complex things you can get out of the piano, even if you have no idea what you're doing. I'm a good person to teach all of this to you because I am not a piano player. Uh, I'm a guitarist. My, the sum total of my piano education is two weeks of lessons in 1994. Uh, and since then, I've just been doing a lot of like hunting and pecking with my index finger. The beautiful thing about computer music is that that is all the keyboard skill that you really need. Uh, before we jump in, the keyboard is not the only way to enter MIDI into the computer. There are a bunch of different ways you can do it. Uh, you can just draw it directly in with the mouse or the touchpad, uh, which is how I do it 90% of the time because I'm such a lousy keyboard player. Uh, there are MIDI controllers that are not based on the piano metaphor, but that are based on other instruments as well. So for example, there are wind controllers that look kind of like little plastic saxophones. Uh, there are guitar controllers, which are regular guitars, and which cost a fortune. In general, though, um, the most common MIDI controller you're going to encounter is a piano type thing like this. Um, it is not, in fact, necessary to have any kind of specialized MIDI controller. You can actually play in all the MIDI that you want to off your regular old computer keyboard. Um, it's, it uses, uh, it's just called Keyboard MIDI, uh, and a lot of different programs support it. GarageBand does, Ableton Live does. Um, the layout of Keyboard MIDI is the same as the piano keyboard. So even if you don't have a piano keyboard, this should still be useful to you. So uh, let's jump in. So in the Western tuning system, there are 12 pitches. And there's, they have this eccentric naming system, which seems kind of insane and nonsensical. But it emerged for historical reasons, so we just got to kind of deal with it. Um, the uh, home base, the kind of fundamental note around which everything else is organized, is C. Now, you might wonder. If the note names go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, why isn't the first note considered to be A? Wouldn't that make more sense? Uh, it certainly would make more sense, but there's some mysterious historical reason why, no, it's actually C. So anyway, things start and end on C. Next, we've got C sharp, then D, then D sharp, then E, then F. And you might notice there is no E sharp. Uh, we just skip straight to F. Then we've got F sharp, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, B, and C. Uh, going down, C, B. Um, we can also call this note B flat in, in addition to A sharp. Then A, A flat, so another name for G sharp. G, G flat, another name for F sharp. F, E, E flat, another name for D sharp. D, D flat, which is another name for C sharp. And C. Um, you might find it sort of confusing and annoying that there is no E sharp or F flat, and there is no B sharp or C flat. But that little bit of asymmetry in the black and white pattern is actually super useful because it helps you very easily see where you are on the computer, uh, the, on the piano keyboard. Um, so a little bit about this sharps and flats business. Uh, as I said, C sharp and D flat are two different names for the same thing, the black key in between C and D. Uh, back in musical history, there was actually a meaningful difference between C sharp and D flat. They were actually different notes, but in the modern tuning system that everybody uses, they are the same note, just two different names for the same thing. So maybe the weirdest and most interesting thing about this note naming system is that you could start on C, 
go up, 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 and end up back on C. So both of these notes are called C, even though they're quite obviously different notes. And this gets at the fact that uh, the note naming system is circular. The technical term is uh, the pitch class system is circular. So this note is called middle C. It's also known as C4. This note is called C5. The next one up is C6. The next one up after that is C7. Uh, going down from C4, you get C3, C2, C1. And then you, if you were to keep going down, you would get C0, C1, uh, C2, and so on. Uh, the lowest note that has ever been recorded in nature is a vibrating gas cloud um, somewhere in outer space with a black hole in the middle of it that uh, produces the note B flat 57 octaves below middle C. So that's like B flat negative 56, I think. So that's your fun nerdy science fact for today. Uh, the distance between any two notes with the same name, between any of the C's or any of the D's or any of the E's or any of the F's or whatever, is called an octave. Um, that's because there are eight notes in between these two C's, these two D's. Um, we'll get into where the word octave comes from in the next video, but it's an interesting thing that humans perceive notes that are an octave apart from each other to be the same note. Um, there are physiological reasons for that. Um, these two notes share pretty much the whole same overtone series. Uh, and humans are actually not the only species that perceive octave equivalency, that perceive these two notes as being the same somehow. Uh, rhesus monkeys also have octave equivalency, and so do some other primates. Uh, no one knows why, but interesting. Uh, so, so far we've been talking about the notes in an order that's called the chromatic scale, which just means the notes on the piano keyboard in order. There's another very common way of ordering the notes, which is called the circle of fifths. And the circle of fifths works like this. So say you start on C, and you go up five notes. Two, three, four, five on the white keys. So you wind up on G. If you go up five notes from G, one, two, three, four, five, you wind up on D. If you go up five notes from D, you wind up on A. And uh, if you just keep going up this interval called a fifth, you get to E, B, F sharp, C sharp, and so on, you wind up back on C. So the same way that if you go up the piano keys in order, you go from C back to C. Um, if you do it in fifths, you also go from C back to C. And the circle of fifths is super, super important for Western music theory. Things that are close to each other on the circle of fifths are considered to be harmonically related and will generally sound good together. Things that are distant from each other on the circle are considered harmonically unrelated and will sound bad if played at the same time. And we will talk much more about that in the next couple videos. Uh, so finally, here is side by side a comparison between the circle of half steps half steps, again, just the way the keys are laid out on the uh, piano keyboard, and the circle of fifths. Um, one of them is the, uh, what's the mat mathematical term? The involute of the other. They have this very interesting mathematical relationship, which if you're into math, you should look into. It's super cool. Anyway, in the next video, we're going to talk about how to use all of this information to make actual music. So check it out.